All right. Last time, I wanted to go over a couple topics. And I remember one I went over and one I didn't. So let me just look up to see what the third one was. I know I wanted to talk about boxing and unboxing, which we talked about. And I wanted to talk about exceptions, which we did not talk about. But I thought there was a third one in there. Let me look real quick to see if I can see in the example that I had planned for last week. I think that was it. Um, so let's look at exceptions. Can anyone define what an exception is? Have you seen exceptions in other programming languages? Right. Uh, an exception by and large is like a problem, uh, an error, uh, an unusual circumstance. And there's some exceptions that you really can't do anything about. All right. There's other exceptions that you might be able to do something about. At the very least, if you had a, you know, if you had a program that, for example, expected a number, and when we talk about user interfaces in a short time, we'll find that, that one of our things that we can put data in is a text box. Well, a text box, you can put any kind of text in. So you may have a function that is expecting a number, but you supply a string in the text box. So you have to convert the string into a number. Well, that works all fine and good if you actually have an, a number. Uh, contained in the text box. But if you have a non-numeric field, the conversion is going to blow up. Well, that's the kind of problem that you can do something about, right? If you're talking about a, a GUI where the user is supposed to enter a number in, and they enter something else in, and press the submit button to process the, the, the information, we could display a, a label on the screen that says, hey, you got to enter a number in here. All right, so that's an exception that we can do something about. We can inform the user what the problem was, inform them what they need to do to correct it, and the program continue, as opposed to the program simply blowing up and stop execution. All right. Other kinds of exceptions we might not be able to do quite as much about. Like, for example, if the database is down that we're trying to connect to. I guess we could still inform the user of that. Maybe we write to a log the particular kind of problem that we've gotten so that someone can research it later, and so on. So there's a couple different sorts of exceptions in that there's some that we can, we, we can do something about and others uh, that we really can't do much about. But we might want to do a little something about it, like at the very least log it. All right? And that's what an exception is. Now, there's exceptions that happen as part of the Java language. All right? And then there are exceptions that we can build into our own classes to handle unusual situations. A good example of that is the pizza classes. Right now, we've assumed that everyone is going to follow the conventions of the class. In other words, if the size was S, M, and L, that that's what you put in. You don't put in something that's invalid. You don't know if someone else that is going to use that class, though, is going to follow that convention correctly. So you might want to put some kind of check and a test for an illegal valid, uh, an illegal value, rather, 
and display some sort of error message and, and go on and proceed. So that's what we're going to look at today. And we're going to start out by looking at uh, exceptions that are just with the basic Java classes, exceptions that are thrown just by basic Java processing. For example, I'm going to create a little just test program here that contains an array list and And we're going to create an array list. Thank you. So let me just create a, an array list. And we'll make an array list of strings. So I'll make it as a new array list of strings. And I'm going to go and add just a couple items to the array list. Then I'm intentionally going to code a loop incorrectly. As we see here, there are only two elements in the array list. If we were doing this right, we would initialize i at 0, do this as long as i is less than the list size, and each time through the list would increment i by 1. and then would output the value of the ith element in that list. Okay, I'll, I'll take a look at that in a second as soon as I finish coding it. Where is public spelled on? Oh, it's static, okay. All right, so let's go.
All right, so let's go and run this. All right, compiles clean. And when I go to run it, it gives me the two messages. Now, if I intentionally mess up this loop, though, instead of doing i less than or equal to, or less than list size, if I just say less than or equal to list size, that's going to blow up, right? Because it's going to try 0, 1, and 2. There is no element sub 2. There's only elements sub 0 and 1. It's going to blow up when we try to get element with a subscript of 2. And there we go. And it tells us there's only two elements in the array, and we tried to get an element with a subscript of 2 which is actually element 3 in the array. Because remember, we start counting with element 0. So a thing that has two elements in it, an array list that has two elements in it, will have array element 0 and 1. It will not have something with a, with a value of 2. So that's an exception, and it blew up the program. All right? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to write code to catch this exception. In Java terminology, a problem is an exception that gets thrown. Dealing with that exception is catching that exception. So something throws the exception, then something else catches the exception. So in this case, the instruction that threw the exception is this one right here. The rest of it can execute correctly. We could execute the loop three times. It's only when we try to access element two that we run into a problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap this instruction in a try catch block. All right. What that allows us to do is to say there's a potential problem with these instructions. If you get an error, this is how I want you to handle it. And we're going to do that for any error right now. All right, We're going to do that for any error. We're not going to test for specific kinds of exceptions. Excuse me. So if I say, I can say try, I can then put the, 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 potential, the potentially problematic, problematic statements in a try block. Then I can say catch. Exception E. If the statement executes correctly, it'll execute. If there's a problem, though, it will go down and it will look for the specific exception it gets thrown. Now, exceptions are a hierarchy. So on the top of the list, the top ancestor of all exceptions is the exception. All right? All the other exceptions are subclasses of that. So if I say catch exception, I'm going to do this processing for any exception, no matter what it is. OK, so no matter what the exception is, this snippet of code in the catch block is going to get executed. We can actually be more granular. And if there's one kind of problem, do one thing. If there's another kind of problem, do something else. But right now, we're catching a specific exception. Or we're, we're catching all exceptions, rather, regardless of the specific exception. We're catching it with this catch block. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out a message 
This is going to be my message, and I can make it user-friendly and say, no element in position I. So as we run this, if everything goes OK, it's going to output the value of the string. If there's a problem, however, and this is an illegal subscript, the catch block gets control. All right. If there's an exception thrown by this line, the catch block gets the uh, control. And regardless of the particular error that we get, it is going to call this line and output this message. I use a colon instead of a semicolon. So I don't get that big ugly exception. I get an uh, exception message of my choosing, which I can make user friendly and can explain the situation to the level of detail that I want to. And the good point of this is, is that it continues to run. So if I change this, I'm going to get rid of the try and catch. If I say for i less than 100, at the first time that an exception is thrown, this is going to terminate. So this will blow up during the third trip through the loop. And it won't execute anymore. All right? First time through the loop, second time through the loop, the exception, it blew up. All right? If I put back the try catch block, however, this will continue, and it will not blow up the first time it gets an exception. It will simply, it'll simply display the error message and continue on. So even though it got an exception way out here in position two, it continues on for the rest of the iterations through the loop. So, We've caught it, we've displayed a message, and we let the program continue. That's assuming that we want to let the program continue. In some cases, there are such ugly errors that we just want it to blow up, all right? In which case, we, can, we don't have to have exception handling for that. Excuse me. Are there any questions? Now, we could do something like this. I'm going to say if i is equal to 1, I want the two equals. The one equal would not give me an error either way. It just logically wouldn't work. I want the two equals because i is a primitive. Right. I'm going to put null in that object. All right? Now, a null object is an object pointer that points to nothing. 
Remember we talked about object pointers and we talked about objects, how objects get created on the heap and the object pointer points to the memory location of those objects. A object pointer that doesn't point to anything is called a null object reference. In other words, we have the pointer, but it's not pointing to anything. I'm just doing this to get a different kind of error, okay? Because this will give me a different kind of exception than the other, than the other error would. So I just want to demonstrate that. index and object, so. Let's try this. It told me that I have a null object in that position and didn't blow up. That's cool. What if I do this? And ask for the length of the object. It tells us that there's no element in that position, all right? The reason it does that is because I have the same code regardless of the kind of exception that happens. So let's go and comment out the exception handling again. Yeah, because hello is the first string, H-E-L-L-O. Oh. All right. And the second one started out as being goodbye, and then I set it to null. Oh. So it tells me it's null. Okay. Or actually, it tells me, gives me that, that error. Right. Gotcha. All right, null pointer exception. All right, that is the error that we get if there is no object where there's supposed to be an object. All right, We've, I've created an error here. And what I can do is say, null pointer exception E, and I can output to say null element, null string at position P. So it tells me that at position one there's a null string, but then it blew up 
on element two. Why did it blow up on element two? Because there isn't anything in those elements, and the exception that was thrown is index out of bounds exception. Okay? What I've done here, and this might be a little confusing, but what I've done here is I've created two problems with this array list. One problem is I've blanked out element one. The other problem is elements two through 99 don't exist. Those are each different exceptions. And originally, I was checking for any kind of exception. And I said, catch exception. Catch any kind of exception that we have and display this message. Now, I'm checking for specific kinds of problems. I display one message if there is a null exception, saying that that element is null. But I don't have any catch for the index out of range exception. So let's put that in here. Okay, thanks. Let me let me fix that. So now notice what happens. Oh. I forgot to change the, the message. I get the null message for the one that was null. I get the invalid index for all the rest of them. Because what I've done is I've defined specific exceptions here to say if you get this kind of problem, display this message. If you get this kind of problem, display this message. Questions about that? All right. So what I did again is I made a two element array list. I looped until I is less than 100. So therefore, I'm going to get a lot of errors on invalid index. I've nulled one of those elements in that array list out. So it's a null string. I can't take the length of a null string. It gives me a null pointer exception. And therefore, I get this error message to display and this error message to display. Does that make sense? Realize maybe it's a little roundabout explanation, but I wanted to show the key thing is, is my try in it has a list of statements that could go wrong. All right? My catches are looking for the specific problems that could exist. I could be referring to a subscript that's out of range, or I could be referring to a null string pointer. And I have different errors for each of those things. Questions about this? These, by the way, are called runtime errors. Runtime errors are worse than compile errors, right? Because with compile errors, your code simply doesn't run. All right? You try to run a line of code, and it can't, because you violated the rules of the language. So the compiler doesn't understand what it's supposed to do. Those are typically syntax errors. You violate the rules of the language. These are other kinds of errors. The runtime errors, the language has been followed, but we've executed statements that, for one reason or other, are illegal. In this case, one of the things that we did that was illegal is we tried to use a null object. And you can't do anything with a null object reference. Second thing that 
we did illegal is we tried to access a element that's out of range. And again, that will also give us an error. These statements could work. In other words, if I went and added 100 elements to this array list, then I would never get that out of range exception. And in this case, I'm trying. I forced an error here. So I wrote code deliberately to get an error. Normally, you're not going to have code that deliberately produces errors. You'll pr produce enough errors accidentally. You don't have to write code to actually generate errors. All right. But this is meant to simulate some kind of problem where, for whatever reason, that array uh, object gets nulled out. Questions about this? These are just using standard built into the Java language exceptions that can arise in your code. All right? Now, we can also write exceptions for our own classes. And that's what I have here. Put these in a little exception one folder. I'll put these in the exception two folder. In this case, we have a triangle class. All right. We all know what triangles are, right? Three sides, right. Now, I don't have a pencil. That's OK. You know what a triangle looks like. And I have a class, let's say, for triangles. And that class is going to have three attributes in it. The length of side one, the length of side two, length of side three. Now, what do I know? In order for it to be a legal triangle, what are some things that have to be true? All the sides have to equal what? Well, the angles of the, of the three things have to equal 180. That's a true statement. Uh, we're not going to store angles, though. We're going to store sides. What do we know about the sides of a triangle? On a right triangle, one's a hypotenuse. That's correct. Not all triangles have a hypotenuse, but right triangles do. Well, I'll, I'll give you an easy one. All right. All the tri all the sides have to have a positive value for the length. Right. We can't have a triangle whose length is negative two inches. All right. We can't have a triangle whose length is zero inches. All right. So all the sides have to have a positive value for the length. All right. There's another rule about triangles, though. Not just right triangles, but all triangles. And that is that the sum of any two sides is always going to be greater than the length of the third side. All right, what do I mean? There are literally no markers or pens in this room. Well, I'll open up a Word document. I'll open up a paint document. There we go. We'll have fun painting. So. Going to draw a triangle. All right. Let's say this one side is three. This one side is five. And this one side is four. Is that a legal triangle? Yes, it is. 
And you know why? Well, number one, all the three triangle sides are positive numbers. And number two, if I add any of the two sides together, it's greater than the third side. So three and five are eight. Eight is greater than four. Four and five are nine. Nine is greater than three. Three and four are seven, and seven is greater than five. OK? Make sense? This is not legal. If I said this side has a length of 1, all right, that's not a legal triangle. Because 1 plus 3 is 4, and 4 is less than 5. So that is not a legal triangle. So the sum of any two sides has to be greater than the third side for all three sides. Okay? If you think about it, it would make sense. Because if, it, if this was true, I'd be able to get from here to here, it would be shorter to take a crooked route than it would be a straight route. Right? You know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Right? So therefore, the distance, if the distance from here to here is 5, there's no way that we could take a different route that involved a bend in the road and end up getting there quicker with less of the space. I hope you understand that. If you don't, just remember that it's a rule, that the sum of two sides has to be greater than the third side. So that's the exceptions I have built into my triangle class. In this case, I'm generating the exception, OK? In the previous example I gave, the Java framework was throwing the exceptions. I was writing the code to catch them. In this example, because I'm dealing with my own class, I'm going to both throw the exceptions and catch them. Because I'm the one making this triangle class, I know what makes the class invalid. What is, an, what is a legal and what is an illegal triangle. So I have in here, I have in the constructor, I say that this throws an exception. Ed, if the sum of the sides two sides are not greater than the third side, then I throw an exception and I say each side must be less than the sum of the other sides. Notice what I did to do that. I have to say that this function throws an exception. If I don't say that this function throws an exception, Java's going to accept, expect this code to handle the exception. If we don't handle the exception, but we want to pass it on to whoever called it, we say that that, that exception is thrown by the function. So in this case, I have an if statement that says, if these things happen, then I'm going to throw an exception. I then have for each side, if the argument is less than 1, all right, they're all integers, so less than 1 is valid. If it's less than 1, then I throw an exception saying side 1 is invalid. Side 2 is invalid. Side 3 is invalid. All right? So I have in my constructor, I have a test to make sure that each side is less than the sum of the other two sides. I then have, for setting each side, I have a check to make sure that each side is greater than 0. Because if it's less than 1, then I'm throwing an exception. Notice what I'm doing here, by the way. My constructor doesn't say side 1 equals arg1 my constructor calls the set method. 
Why do you think I do that? Why do you think I do that? If I could just as well say side one equals arg one right here. Yeah. I only have to have the exception coded in one place. All right. Now I just noticed this. After I said it, I should retest this exception again, all right? Because I could set up the triangle correct initially and then change the value of one of its sides and screw it up. So I should test this exception every time I set a side also. All right, let's look at the code that calls us now the unit test. I'm trying out my boxing business. All right. I create my three integers. So even though these functions call require an int, I can give it an integer. Why? Because ints and integers are automatically converted to each other, boxed or unboxed, depending on which direction we're going. So I create these things. This is not a valid triangle, right? Because 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 is not bigger than 8. So therefore, that should not be valid. It's not going to catch this null exception pointer. It's not going to catch this number format exception. It is, however, going to catch uh, a third exception. Um, I must have been showing something. It's actually going to be caught by this exception. All right, it threw an exception saying that each side must be the sum of the other side. This is not one of the two exceptions that I expected. Now, when would it get a null pointer exception? If I did this. then it would tell that it got a null pointer exception because that object does not exist. It's pointing to a null object. If I did something like this,
would give us that error, right? Because say we'll convert a one to an integer, right? So it sets it as one, one, and eight. That's not valid. But what if I went in and put something goofy in here? Then it will give me number format exception. All right? So we can test for specific exceptions, and we can have code written just to handle those specific exceptions. Now, I'm not doing anything drastically different in any of these cases, depending on the exception. I'm just displaying a message. But we could do all kinds of different things depending on the specific error that we've gotten. All right? At the very least, we could display different messages, but we could do more than that as well. We're going to review this example a little bit more. Um, next time, we'll talk about this. I, I, I'm afraid I was a little confusing on a few things, so we'll try to clarify that next time and maybe do some more examples. And then, I think our next step is user interfaces. I'm not sure, but that's always a fun part of the class. All right, we'll see you up in lab.